Hello, everyone, and thanks for hanging out with us for the Behind the Numbers Weekly Listen, an e-marketer podcast made possible by M Particle. This is the Friday show that reviews the most frighteningly important media and retail news stories of the week. I'm your host, Marcus Johnson, in today's show. Are VR and AR the next big platforms? Will it look cool? Can people make it? Can stylize? I just don't really see that. So there's, the, the use cases are very specific in particular. I'm not quite sure I can envision anything in the near future where that will change much. Do we need 3D advertising? Is it immersive or is it interruptive? Is there a consumer benefit? I think it'll make sense when we do arrive in the metaverse and, and we're living in these 3D immersive worlds, but in the immediate term, I don't see the point. How are in-store shopping habits changing? You know my loyalty is bad off the gate when I'm coming through your door, so my question for retailers is, how are you going to give me a reason to keep coming back to you now that I'm here? What to do about inflation, an unpopular opinion about Zoom, and the one limb first phenomenon. Join me for today's episode. We have three people. Let's meet them. We start with our senior director of briefings. It's Stephanie Tagalinetti. Hey, thanks. Happy to be here for the first time. Hello, Stephanie. Welcome. To the show. It's her first episode. Uh, she is joined by a couple of regulars. We have Oscar Orozco, who's one of our forecasting directors. Hey, Marcus. Happy to be here. Hey, chap. And finally, we have Dave Franklin, who is our principal analyst who heads up our marketing practice. How's it going, Marcus? Very good, sir. A uh, very good. What have we got in store for you guys today? What's on the menu? We start with the story of the week. Are VR and AR the next big platforms? Might they replace? The smartphone. We then move to the game of the week where our contestants, Stephanie, Oscar and Dave, go head to head to head to give us the best takeaways they can from each of the four stories we have for you to win a pretend championship belt. We then move to uncommon knowledge. We talk about some unpopular opinions and finally dinner party data is where we discuss a little random trivia we've recently learned about. But we start, as always, story of the week. Are VR and AR the next big platforms? From Apple to Google, big tech is building VR and AR headsets. They might just be the next big platform after the smartphone, suggests The Economist. Nearly every big tech company is rushing to develop a VR or AR headset, convinced that what has long been a niche may be on the brink of becoming something much larger. They point to Meta, which sold 10 million or so Quest 2 devices in the past 18 months. Microsoft pitching its pricier HoloLens 2. Apple expected to unveil its first headset by early 2023, somehow that's next year, Uh, with another model in the pipeline. Google working on a set of goggles known as Iris, ByteDance, Sony, Snap, all developing eyewear of their own. Magic Leap will launch their second generation of its AR glasses in September. And Jitesh Ubrani of IDC believes that within a decade, sales may rival those of smartphones. VR and AR devices. In mature markets, Hugo Swat of Qualcomm agrees, thinks the space will be bigger than smartphones. On the other hand, Tony Faddle, a former Apple executive who helped develop the iPhone, says that in the foreseeable future, headsets will be a bit like smartwatches, popular but not revolutionary in the same way that smartphones have been. Dave, I'll start with you. Uh, Where do you land? Are you convinced that AR and VR will be the next big platforms? So I'd, I'd say a couple of things. I would separate them out. Mm-hmm. I think uh, VR is, is likely to be a next platform. I don't know if it's the next big platform. I don't know that I would agree with that. From an AR point of view, I actually think the phone usage of AR on phones is really interesting. And I do think it's where there'll be some glasses opportunity with information showing up. I think there's a big B2B application there, manufacturing whatnot, to be able to see information that's useful to what else you're doing at the same time to understand how to fix things in a product sense, etc. The big unknown for me as I think about this is Apple. They've shown time and time again, if they're serious about something and they do jump in, they just change the trajectory of everything when they get serious about something. They create product categories, yeah. And it's still early days. It's still so, so soon. Only 16 million headsets will be shipped this year, according to Omdia, points out that 90%, 90 90% of the $2 billion spent on VR content last year went to games. So it seems easy to dismiss this as something that just gamers are doing, but that's still because it's very early days, but there are plenty of applications that could emerge and are starting to emerge. Stephanie, where do you land? Is it the next big thing or something that will coexist with the smartphone like a smartwatch, but not right near as big? Yeah, I tend to agree with Dave. Uh, I think it'll be a big thing, but not the biggest thing and certainly not as big as a smartphone. 
pardon, my mind always goes to health because it's closest for me. It's what content I edit. So I know there are many fitness applications cropping up. You know, you can pick up a headset, enter a boxing ring and track your vitals. But for me, you know, I'm not going to buy a $400 piece of hardware to work out. Gym membership is a fraction of the cost and there's plenty of free videos on YouTube to do just that very thing. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to business applications, you know, there's some cool stuff in hospitals, like, you know, letting a surgeon scrub in virtually to an operating room mm -hmm. and assist from afar. And while cool, you know, there's still resistance. These are implications on patients' actual health. And the trust just isn't there from doctors right now with VR tech, at least. Generally yeah. speaking, if you think of consumers, hardware is still a ways away from replacing smartphones. A tech analyst on my team, hey, Gadjo, he said the battery life for these things is about three hours or under three hours. They're pretty uncomfortable. It's not like a pair of glasses you can pick up and fit one to your personal anatomy. It's kind of a one size fits all design. Yep. And you got to be near a Wi-Fi hotspot to use it. So I just don't, I don't think yep. they're, I think they're a ways away from replacing smartphones. Some excellent points. Uh, smartphone shipments in the US has fallen from its peak of 176 million in 2017 to 153 in 2021, according to IDC. That's still 153, and that is shipments. That doesn't mean that the number of people who have them is going down. Oscar, where do you land? Because you see smartphones, they've reached their peak in terms of shipments, but everyone has one. But then on the other hand, you have a lot of investment, especially Meta. Their VR roadmap reportedly has four new headsets with both higher end and cheaper units, according to Richard Lawler of The Verge, coming out in the next uh, year or two with some more, more of these devices. Is VR and AR the future or just an accomplice to, to smartphones? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, with my colleagues here. Um, absolutely. I think it's far, far away from being anywhere close to what a smartphone is. I, I don't see them as being direct competitors in any way. I think it's, hmm. um, if anything, Good it's point. an added layer of connectivity and digitization. And so it's going to look so different, but again, hand in hand almost with smartphones. So I, I don't see them being competitors in any way. Um, I would say, you know, whenever I could lean into forecasts, I'd love to, you know, VR and AR are here already. We estimate about one in five Americans yeah. use VR in some way. Staggering. Yeah, about one in four use AR, a lot of it coming through social networks. So now the headsets, about one in 10 Americans, which is a big number from what mm -hmm. we estimate. But, you know, it's always diff uh, very complicated. The intersection of like apparel and technology, which Steph mentioned here, is very tricky. Will it look cool? Can people make it, can stylize? I just don't really see that. So there's the, the use cases are very specific in particular. I'm not quite quite sure I can envision anything in the near future where um, where that will change much. Yeah. Where I've used AR in the past that has had incredible utility is uh, the Google Translate app that allows you to use a camera. You can point that in most languages and it'll translate mm. it to English for you. Mm. I've to used the that recently. Mm -hmm. To the extreme, I was in, in Belgium and there was the dishes of the day written on a on a chalkboard and it was able to, to pick that up and translate it because somebody couldn't tell me what some fish was. But while Steph was talking, cool. I uh, I had visions of um, apprentice doctors, you know, and it, you know the, the hip bone connected to the thigh bone, all the rest of it as yep. you're going and uh, yep. you know, various applications. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. One of the points in the Economist article was saying that it's just important to be an early mover in this space because if you're an early mover, you could be a gatekeeper. The Economist noting that Apple and Google established themselves as landlords of the smartphone world, taxing every purchase on their app stores and setting rules on things like advertising. Whoever corners the headset market stands to acquire a similarly powerful gatekeeping position. So for companies, it's important to get out ahead for consumers. Uh, a, less, a lot less so. All right, that's all we've got time for for the story of the week. It's time now for the game of the week. First quick word from our sponsor, Mparticle. At the end of the day, your customer has to be at the center of everything you do. This starts with the correct customer data strategy as well as the right foundation to solve the challenges that typically inhibit success such as data quality, data governance, and connectivity. Mparticle is your real-time customer data infrastructure that helps you accelerate your data strategy by cleansing, visualizing, and integrating your customer data from anywhere to anywhere. Ultimately, better data leads to better decisions, better customer experiences, and better outcomes. See why the best brands choose Mparticle. Go to www.mparticle.com. All right, folks, we are back. It's time now for the game of the week. Today's game, what's the point? 
where I read out four stories and have contestants Stephanie, Oscar and Dave tell us what they think is the main takeaway of the story. Okay answers get you one point. Good yeah. answers get two. And answers that give you the same feeling as when you realise it's a three-day weekend. Yes, please. Answers that leave you with that feeling. They get you three points. Each person gets 20 seconds to answer before they hear this. If you run long, it's a technical foul. Minus two points. Ooh, harsh. Two technical fouls will get you ejected from the game. Whoever has the most points wins, gets the last word. We start with Dave. It's 3D advertising. 3D advertising is poised to make inroads this year with Twitter and Meta among the players looking to this subset of ads as a potential growth driver, writes Insider Intelligence Director of Briefings, Jeremy Goldman. Twitter's Product Explorer lets advertisers show off a product in 3D where users can swipe and rotate the item, Jeremy notes. Meta is also making it easier for brands to run 3D ads on Facebook and Instagram via a partnership with 3D modeling provider Vintana. Dave, 3D advertising, what's the point? I think the point is that 2001 called and it wants its interstitials back. <laughs> um, you know, I was at DoubleClick literally more than 20 years ago and Kelly Blue Book had cars that looked like 3D cars driving across your screen. What I'd come back to is it feels like a gimmick. Is it immersive or is it interruptive? Is there a consumer benefit? I think it'll make sense when we do arrive in the metaverse and, and we're living in these 3D immersive worlds. But in the immediate term, I don't see the point. Stephanie. Yeah, I saw a teaser of Twitter's product, actually, where you can 3D spin a sneaker. whoop de doo um, <laughs> I think there has to be real value, just like Dave said. Are you just trying to capture interest, or is it a gimmick? If it's just to help you get a better look at a product, I don't know. I find that product images and consumer reviews do a good enough job for me. Oscar. Yeah, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here. I mean, given that we just talked about, you know, VR headsets and experiential opportunities. I mean, I think maybe, sure, it was gimmicky uh, a while back, but potentially if we are moving more into the metaverse, it seems like the right play. I mean, for now, these ads seem to appear all natively. You don't need that added hardware, but it makes sense for brands to experiment with this because, you know, advertising is going to look really different in the coming years. In the piece, Jeremy does note 3D and mobile AR ad revenues are growing, 134% expected over the next three years, according to one source, Artillery. We move to our second round. We start with Stephanie. How are in-store shopping habits changing? 62% of folks say their in-store shopping habits have changed in the past year, according to Shopkick, notes Marianne Wilson of Chain Store Age. Nearly 70% of that group who've said their in-store shopping habits have changed, have shifted the time of day and frequency during the week. 52% now go to the store at less busy times, 23% go fewer times a week, and 17% do both. What in-store experiences are most important to consumers? 62% say trying things on and better deals, both with 62% confirming the quality of the product, 61%, convenience, 49 In-person interactions are all support from store associates, 23 and product sampling, just 14%. But Stephanie, how are in-store shopping habits changing? What's the point? I mean, my mind immediately went to how just brand loyalty generally is suffering with inflation and supply chain issues. People, myself included, are becoming more willing to go elsewhere if something's cheaper online or if it's out of stock. I may have never stepped foot in your store if I wasn't frustrated by an experience or a price somewhere else. So you know my loyalty is bad off the gate when I'm coming through your door. So my question for retailers is, how are you going to give me a reason to keep coming back to you now that I'm here? Oscar. Yes, uh, same as Stephanie. I kind of, there was a lot going on in the survey, but I, I was really interested in the loss of brand loyalty. That was a major trend during the pandemic. I've seen studies over the last maybe six, 12 months about that coming back. But, you know, it, it seems like it's, it's back again. Uh, brand loyalty is less of a thing and it's become a long term problem for brands. So I'm cu just curious to see kind of even thinking about CPG companies, for example, how that's going to impact their advertising strategy. This is here to stay for now. Uh, but ultimately, it, it does speak to just the shift to online shopping. That's really what the main theme is with this survey. Dave. Yeah, I would agree with both of our colleagues. You know, I've been doing a ton of research, as you know, into sort of consumer values and how that drives behavior and still price, mm -hmm. availability, convenience trumps those things. But the most interesting part of this, I think, is loyalty being replaced by availability. And it's a confluence of circumstances. All the control is with the consumer. We want everything free in two days. So it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. 
Move to our third round, but at half time, Stephanie out in front, five points. Oscar and Dave tied in second with four. It's all to play for. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie's dancing for so people who can't see. I don't remember these updates, Marcus. It's beginner's luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought it was only the retail team that, that needed this hand holding and worried it about is, points and all that stuff. Yeah. This is 100% because of Blake Susie. Blake and Susie, right? Bloody I was going to say Susie. Susie huh? <laughs> what the hell are we doing? Anyway, let's press on. Thanks, Susie. Thanks, Susie, for nothing. She gets a million points when she's not here. <laughs> <laughs> we start with Oscar. Tension economy slowdown. Tech appears to be coming back down to earth, or at least thinking about heading in that direction. Sarah Fisher of Axios notes some recent earnings that suggest so. Meta's North American 1% revenue growth was the lowest since it went public in 2012. That was in Q1. YouTube's Q1 growth was seven times slower than its last Q1. And Spotify's premium subscriber growth in Q1 slowed right down. But the attention economy slowed down. Oscar, what's the point? Yeah, I, I, this was interesting. A lot to unpack here. I mean, I think we can't ignore that this is being accelerated, right, by the crippling inflation and supply chain issues and everything that we're dealing with the war. However, we've seen this uh, tech bubble bursting. I mean, I, I, it made me think of, you know, the, the millennial led businesses that, that allowed for cl- kind of glamour living and low cost, all of that, and how that's kind of going away. Businesses that have been operating at a loss for so long that can no longer do that. I think tech is finally getting to that place where they either need to turn a profit or maybe disappear. And so I think when you think of consumers, we need to speak with our wallets. You know, we need to subscribe if we like that particular service, support it by buying products, do whatever we need, uh, because some businesses right, are going to disappear in the coming years. Dave. I don't mean to be uh, unfair, but I think Sarah Fisher might have been given a thousand words that she needed to fill, and uh, this is what came out. Um, I'm not sure what's a surprise in here. Yeah. You know, we had artificially inflated expectations based on us all being locked down for two years. Of course, we had more attention to focus on things. That's sort of the reverting to the mean or law of physics that what goes up comes down. We're still ahead of where we were. I would agree with your question. What's the point? Stephanie. Yeah, agree with with Dave. You know, we had high expectations. I mean, and I was also thinking too about the streaming space, just feeling like it's being produced by DJ Khaled over the last few years. Like another <laughs> one, another one. Um, <laughs> I, you know, and I don't know where to go sometimes. I certainly don't trust Netflix to suggest things for me. I share a login with my mom. She has trash taste in TV, so I end up somewhere else. So I don't know. Unsurprising, highly relatable. (laughs) (laughs) I was, because it said attention economy, I did look at some of our time spent numbers, Oscar, that your team puts together. And it was quite surprising, to be honest. Average time spent on smartphones, that does keep climbing. It's three hours and 20 minutes today. It's three hours and 30 minutes next year. But time spent using social networks is flat, one hour and 35. Time spent on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, even TikTok is flat to creeping down. Time spent on YouTube and Netflix is pretty much flat. It's gaining a minute each year, but it's pretty much flat according to our own numbers. So according to attention being time spent, yeah, it's really slowed down slash maybe going down a bit depending on where you're spending that time. And bear in mind that attention is split there, Marcus, too, right? Most people who are doing many of those things are doing them at the same time as one of the other things you mentioned. 100%. A lot of multitasking. Uh, and yep. just yep. Sh- just a shout out to the we do have updated metrics and and numbers forecast coming out mm. shortly so uh keep an eye out for those yeah very good check out pro for those guys we move to our final round stephanie's still just out in front we move to the fourth round which is points and a half so you can get points and a half for this round so you get one and a half points three or four and a half points completely made up like everything that we do uh what to do about inflation we start with dave us gdp fell 1.4 percent in q1 a sharp reversal from the near 7% it saw in Q4. From December to March, almost three out of four companies in the S&P 500 mentioned inflation in earnings calls, according to Fact Set, notes The Economist. Renault says raw material costs will double or triple this year. Tesla's suppliers are requesting 20 to 30% increases in parts. Unilever raised prices 8% on average in Q1. Nestle, the world's biggest food company, which has barely increased prices for years, raised them by over 5% year on year in Q1, the biggest increase since 2008, The Economist notes. Lots of companies have managed to push up prices without alienating their consumers, but for how long? Dave, what to do about inflation? What's the point? 
There's a limited amount we can do, right, other than write it out. Everything that went on with COVID, you know, just the challenges of getting to raw materials. You look at what's going on in Ukraine. Look at what's going on now in India. It's just, it's harder to get materials. Prices are going up. You you drive past every gas station. You see prices going up, etc. So, you know, at the same time, so much money was pumped into the economy during the crisis. Uh, lots of people made money on the stock market. That's drying up. And so, you know, I think the article was a little confusing in the divergence of opinion. But, you know, I'm not an economist and I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn last night. So I can't I can't answer this one for you. <laughs> Stephanie. Yeah, I mean, I myself spent eight dollars on a Starbucks coffee over the weekend. Oh. I, I didn't go somewhere else, but I, I almost did. Uh, <laughs> since people aren't completely balking at the price increases is what I'm getting at. If we're talking about how to contend with it, I'm no expert, but something I've witnessed firsthand that's totally wasteful is packaging, online grocery. I received a bag in my entire order of multiple bags with plenty of room, one single grapefruit in a bag. <laughs> I mean, come on, isn't that isn't that something we can do a better job at here? The hell is going on? <laughs> yeah. Oscar. I agree with Stephanie. I mean, people seem to be more receptive to the price increases right now. But the longer this goes on, I do think that it'll become more of a problem. People are going to have to prioritize what they're buying. So I kind of thought about, you know, just flexible payment options, something I cover a little bit at the company. Uh, I think, you know, retailers, brands need to keep providing those. I think the BNPL, buy now, pay later providers are going to do well. Retailers themselves have to think about how, you know, just uh, being able to extend out the the payment options for consumers that that'll help them out and you know potentially they might pay that back with more loyalty further down the line yeah, every time the petrol prices are it, it is an incredible indicator of how expensive things are you go and it's four dollars and you look again it's five dollars you look again and it just says don't even bother <laughs> don't bother coming here because you're not going to be able to afford it just walk just walk Have a bite. um that's all we got time for for the game of the week this week's winner a drum roll. Stephanie is Thank this you. week's winner. Thank you. She got 10 points to Oscar and Dave's eight, but she mainly won because of her DJ Khaled reference. <laughs> I think she should win just because she's got the biggest smile I've ever seen on this uh, Zoom screen. Our <laughs> listeners can't see, but it was it was. I've excellent. not been tainted by multiple well appearances deserved. with Marcus yet. <laughs> yeah, no, it'll come. Give it time. It'll come. Give it time. <laughs> it fades each time you make a appearance. <laughs> Congratulations to Stephanie. She wins the game of the week, the championship belt, and... I probably didn't say this to you, Stephanie, before, and I apologize. But you also get 30 seconds of free airtime to tell the world whatever you want to tell them. Have you seen a recent Netflix show that you need to tell them about? Oh, yes. Podcast, um, read a book? On Apple TV, the show oh. Severance, if you haven't checked it out, it's okay. like a dark comedy with Adam Scott. I highly recommend if you're into like, you know, nice. psychological thrillers, dark TV shows, very cool, has a sort of like scripted but serial black mirror vibe to it oh highly recommend severance apple tv but check you it need out. an apple subscription to get in there so mm -hmm. yeah talk Never about mind. the subscription <laughs> fatigue um. <laughs> you can't use your mom's login no she's watching <laughs> <Yay>! trash. <laughs> <laughs> it's so. time now for uncommon knowledge Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge, the segment where we offer up some unpopular or atypical opinions about things. We start with an unpopular opinion from BBC Radio 1, uh, where the segment was inspired by, then an unpopular opinion uh, from the internet, and finally we get an unpopular opinion from one of us related to uh, work, to the media world. We start with an unpopular opinion from BBC Radio 1. Here we go. Donuts with sprinkles should not be the donut poster child. The reason I say this before you bite my head off is because Ipsos uh, ran a poll last year asking Americans their favorite flavor of donut. Number one was cream filled donuts. Yuck. 22%. Plain glazed donuts <laughs> came in second. Disappointing second. 18%. Chocolate glazed, 12%. Cake slash old fashioned and jelly filled were joint fourth with 9% each. Sprinkles, just 4%. Hmm. How do we feel? I'm really surprised by that. I mean, I'm a chocolate glazed guy, so third there. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. I know sprinkles. I mean, you can't. It's hard to show the anything, any filling, right? Just to, visually, it's not yeah, as it can appealing. Yeah, get a little gross yeah. visually. So I think I like the sprinkles. I think they look great. I think I the know, sprinkles, right? from a poster child point of view, the sprinkles help distinguish them from bagels. 
But you know what? Donuts have evolved so much in the last few years with Talk like to very fun toppings like bacon or even just cookies oh. and cereal. Why not what? why not showcase some Too of much. the cool stuff in the donut <laughs> world beyond, you know, your your original sprinkle? Stephanie, where are you getting your donuts? Okay. That's what I asked you. Bacon. Donuts just comes out yeah. of this stuff after she won the game of the week. Where was this stuff <laughs> earlier? Yeah, you would not have won. A lot if I'd of them are in Los time. Angeles on the West Coast. They have very okay. obscure Let's keep donuts. Bre- breakfast and lunch. That is shocking. Um, all right. We feel sprinkles, maybe. We'll let you continue to be the poster child. Uh, but it's glazed. Let's be real for a second. All right, I've got another one for you. <laughs> From the internet, there is no such thing. I should stop doing relationship ones because it's, been, it's really <laughs> ruining people's lives. There is no such thing as the honeymoon phase. I guess this could apply to a lot of things. You move somewhere or you get a new job or relationships. Is there a honeymoon phase? Does it exist? 100%. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Oh, wow. Okay. No. I think it's with anything that's new and exciting. <laughs> this is going to sound bad, but it just that that newness and excitement doesn't last forever, Dies right? Out. And that's what it refers to. It assumes new is positive. It's Not true. Always. That's true. Sometimes you don't know where you're if, going. You don't know how to get somewhere. Yeah. Like all like, you know, to me, yeah. Relationship yeah. wise, I think relationship wise, I think I don't think it makes as much sense as it once did because I think most people cohabit before they get married mm. if that's what honeymoon relates to so not much changes kind of mm. thing whereas moving somewhere a new job whatever it is like you don't know which way is up when you're yeah. starting a lot of new stuff that it makes frankly it makes it hard mm. yeah i was i was thinking for relationships for sure Same. but and uh, just like yeah. you know the first yeah. couple of weeks months of a new relationship mm. Mm. All right, it does fade. That's that's good to know. Uh, all right, all right, folks. Really oh. chipper. <laughs> Gosh, this took a dark turn. Uh, I've got one for you uh, from me. So this uh, unpopular opinion is it's kind of from me. I read it somewhere, and I, I guess I kind of agree with it. But Zoom or video chats are causing more harm than we realize. Harm's a strong word. Um, but a recent article titled "The Cost of Zoom" by Alison Snyder. And Erica Pandy of Axios highlights a few things about how video calls might be holding us back more than we realize. A recent study by Melanie Brooks of Columbia and Jonathan Levov of Stanford reported their findings in the journal Nature. They found a few things. One, pairs, pairs of people working on Zoom came up with fewer ideas than those who weren't, people who were in person. The reason is because they often overlooked a secret source of collaboration is that in-person folks typically share visual cues from their environment and each other that spur ideas. With video chat, all eyes are on screens, ignoring the environment and constraining the associative process underlying idea generation. Also, people move less when they meet virtually and staying still hinders creativity, according to Jeremy Bailenson, a professor at Stanford who studies virtual human interaction. What do we think? I had no idea, but I mean, I'm going to trust people who are doing the research. Personally, I'm a huge fan. Here we are on an audio medium looking at each other. Personally, I, I love it. I think there are times when I've actually at times on calls turned off the video and I find I sometimes listen better because I'm not paying attention Mm. to what's around me or around the person I'm speaking to. But overall, I think it's a huge positive. I have hired three people in the last couple of months whom I've never met in person, but feel I know extremely well. And that has a lot to do with the fact that I see them on a, you know, every day, every other day basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I for one feel very liberated and mental health wise, really enjoy the flexibility of being at home. You know, I can take a walk, speaking of movement, if I have some time around the block. And I think in terms of like limiting people and like, I don't know, professional capacity, I think that's on managers. That's their real responsibility to make sure they're paying attention to their remote workforce. And that could be a symptom, not of video conferences, but actually of management style, I would say. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with with you guys to a point, but you know, yeah, maybe it does heighten other things. Like uh, Dave, I liked your example of turning off the video and and being able to listen a little bit more clearly. But you know, there's always something you might miss from being in person, right? Things that that won't be captured, um, you know, when you're not in the same room as someone. I think there's ways around it, ways to sort of you know maybe not have that impact, you know, your output, but. Ultimately, there, there are things I think that you don't, you can't do through Zoom. So I, I agree with it to a point. Yeah, 
Yeah, so it's interesting to note that, yeah, that you stay still more. And by staying still more, you are less creative because when you move around. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although I don't remember being in meeting rooms and jumping around, other than jumping up to a whiteboard (laughs) a lot. Like if it wasn't getting up to a whiteboard, you're generally sitting in one place, right? So I don't know what these people are doing and what. what, what (laughs) I was thinking of the whiteboard. I've had to, when when I've done interviews, I've like drawn (laughs) things for the whiteboard for sure. Do you understand this? Yeah. But maybe it's. Body language Body as well. Language, like maybe yeah. when you're on this, you're kind of sitting still and, and mostly staring at your own image on Zoom. Um, so maybe you're just more expressive <laughs> and there's more to do with with body language. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Well, you guys, unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that the crew got very animated all of a sudden. <laughs> Sit still. Uh, all right. Around. That's, that's all we've got time for. For uncommon knowledge, it's time now for dinner party data. This is the part of the show where we tell you about the most interesting thing that we've recently learned. We start with Stephanie because she is this week's champion of the game of the week. Stephanie, uh, what random fact do you have for us this week? Did you know, just coming out of April, did you know that April is national Fresh celery month. <laughs> okay. The month Does it have to be fresh? <sighs> fresh celery. And it is referred to as a time to celebrate, quote unquote, one of the produce world's shining stars. And I'm so yes. sorry to people who love celery, but I just am not comfortable with referring to celery as a shining star of produce. It's too much. <laughs> I love that they have to refer to it as fresh. Like- fresh celery. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to... What do we need that? Do we need the celery month? No, thing? it was Arab American month too. So maybe we focus on that one. <laughs> yeah, that's the stuff. Sorry, celery. I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. Uh, all right, Dave, what you got for us? Uh, how many active volcanoes are there in the world? Too many. Too many. Six <laughs> thousand. Yeah, I was gonna say thousands. Maybe well. Really? A hundred. I'm going to go 2000. in the middle. 500. I feel like this is Marcus giving scores for uh, for other answers. <laughs> it's uh, apparently 1,350 active volcanoes worldwide, Ooh. 161 of which are in the U.S., and there are 5,000 considered inactive. So I'm heading over in a couple of weeks to Malta and then over to Sicily, and we will be going to Mount oh. Etna, which is what led me to looking at where are there active Very volcanoes. Nice. So. Uh, Don't go towards them, Dave. I, apparently, we're going on an excursion to Etna, so I'm, I'm actually <laughs> oh, sorry we won't get to it. Basilicata in uh, southern Italy because uh, my favorite wine, or one of my many favorite wines, is Alianico del Vulture, which is a volcanic Ooh. mountain. But you won't get won't there? get there in this trip. What's the point of what? Oh, I'll drink so other close. wines. It's okay. So far. Away. Yeah. All right, fine. All right, I panicked. Uh, very nice, Oscar. What do you have? Okay, great. So, you know, given given all the chatter about loan relief programs and what President Biden might do before the midterm elections, I found this really interesting study on how loans, specifically student loans, have impacted people's health. There are no surprises with the findings, wow. guys. I think you know exactly how they've impacted them. But, you know, overall adults who failed to pay down student debt or took on new educational debt are at a higher risk for heart-related illness later in life than those who have no debt whatsoever. So just something else to consider when, you know, your child is 17 or 18 and deciding if they want to go to college or not, or, you know, how much debt to take on. So so young to, to decide on that. But yeah, ultimately, you know, they did a, a really great study over a long period of time. People interviewed from when they were in seventh grade to 12th, starting in 1994, till they were eight, 44 years old, so long term. And they just kind of put together this cardiovascular disease risk score and just found that people who had more debt were, you know, later in life were having more issues with their health. Um, So, you know, uh, along with all the other things you have to consider, please consider the long term impact of loan uh, of loans and just taking on debt later in life. So really interesting study. Yeah. Some serious effects. Um, you, You said uh, when kids are deciding what school to go to and, and take it into consideration. When I went to college, I remember saying to my dad, I was like, because I grew up in England, I was like, I need to, I think I need to go to the school in the States, you know, I feel like I just need to travel. Mm. 
and get out of here and go to school in America. And he looks at me like I was an insane person and was like, who is paying for that? What the... <laughs> Needless to say, I went to school in the UK. Thank you, Dad. Yeah. Um, Good choice, Max. Good choice. <laughs> so it wasn't really my decision where I went. But um, yes, this costs moving over here and learning all about that world, staggering. Um, yeah, interesting research there, Oscar. Um, it's also interesting to know, when you, you, you could assume something, but it's great to have something back up that assumption. Like you could oh, say, oh, people who are more debt are probably more stressed. But to see the actual research for it, um, I think it's important. The scary part of that is how much greater the debt is now than it was back in did you say 84 oscar um, uh yeah this was 94 94, 94. yeah i mean uh -huh. just imagine how much more it is you know how much yeah. college is going up right now every year every year not that yeah. i have a mm -hmm. 17 year old and a 16 year old and i'm focused on this but you know <laughs> Thought of that, Dave. Thought of that. best of luck Dave. best of luck. europe i'm already on Pick it your favorite yeah <laughs> Uh, all right, I got one for you real quick. And this is called the one limb first phenomenon, which I made up. It's not a real thing. Please don't look, look it up. It's not, it doesn't exist. So uh, a new friend of mine, uh, we were hanging out and um, we were at a, a bakery and we stood next to each other. And for some reason, we both folded our arms. And after we folded our arms, we stood like shoulder to shoulder. We both looked at each other. And it wasn't till then that I realized something. Okay. So we're going to do an experiment with the folks here on, um, on Zoom. So after three, everyone just fold their arms. All right, ready? One, two, three. Okay, it's hard to see backwards. I can't see. Is your right hand on your left bicep? Yes. Everyone? Yes. yes. Yeah. There are people who do it the other way around. Like, and by people, I mean like half of people. So if you ask your friends and family to <laughs> fold their arms, half of them will do it. I'm going to say wrong. Okay? I'm going to go out there and say totally so you're doing it wrong. <laughs> it's insane. I've got another one for you. Crossing your legs. Certain people will cross the other leg first. So watch out for that. And the other one, <laughs> this one's a little dangerous. Putting on pants. Okay? For our English listeners, trousers. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll do it the same leg every single time, but some people will just do the other leg. It's madness. If you've ever tried to put pants on with your less dominant one first, yeah. try to reverse it, you're 100% no, falling. No, that would, that would be a disaster. <laughs> it's, in, it's insane, yeah. I, I yeah I've fallen down multiple times. I would have thought the arm thing was, uh, you know, righties and lefties, but yeah. it's not that. No. Not that, okay. No, it's not even. It's so I mean, random. Just trying to do it, it's hard, like, to do the opposite, right? To the other one, yeah. Yeah, Feels people weird. will do it. Find those people and tell them they're wrong. <laughs> well, we're in the bakery. We made everyone, made everyone strong. <laughs> we, Every, made all the, everyone. we were like, how do you do it? And we, there were like 20 of us in the bakery. Wait, you strong-armed them? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Had to. They're wrong. Okay, Dave. They're just wrong. There's um, there's another one of those which is um, putting on shoes and socks. Whether you put on both socks and then both shoes, or a sock, a shoe, a sock, a shoe. A sock, a shoe. Yeah, come on. <laughs> I've heard that one. Well, who people? does that? <laughs> That's weird. Please. It's mayhem. <laughs> oh, there's there's <laughs> quiet over here. I do, I do sock shoe, Dave. sock shoe. A sock, oh, no. a shoe, and, and I know then, when I started oh, doing it, believe it or not. I camped oh, a lot as a kid, goodness. and I, I remember exactly when I started doing it. It was when you'd, you'd put the sock on, you'd put the shoe on to get out of the tent needed, so that you yeah. could stand up and put the other uh, sock. I, and for some okay. reason it stuck, but apparently it is a thing. My kids think I'm a freak. How long have you been living in a tent? <laughs> <laughs> Enough already. <laughs> Anyway, that's all we got time for for today's episode. Thank you so much to my guests. Thank you to Dave. Thank you. Thank you to Oscar. Thanks for having me. Thank you to Stephanie. Yeah, thanks for having me. This week's winner of the game of the week. Thank you to Victoria, who edits the show. She is indeed back, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks to everyone listening. To ask us questions or just say hi, you can email us at podcast at emarketer.com. We'll see you on Monday, hopefully, for the Behind the Numbers Daily, an eMarketer podcast made possible by M Particle. Happy weekends. Thank you.